Taiwan starts cleaning up the mess left behind by Typhoon Kanun. We ask one analyst what's behind a recent string of military accidents. The US and Australia wrap up one of their largest military exercises to date. Plus, it's land crab breeding season in southern Taiwan. We take a look at what the national park and locals are doing to protect these creatures. A warm welcome to Time Plus News, I'm Betty Chen. Typhoon Kanun is turning away from Taiwan, but its strong winds and rains have left behind damage to buildings, flight cancellations, and thousands of homes are still without power. Bing Wang reports. As Typhoon Kanun clears Taiwan, it's left behind debris across the country. In the east, the typhoon knocked down the bamboo roof of a well-known landmark in Taidong. Trees have collapsed and branches cover the roads. Ah! A market in the same city had 66 tents blown to pieces, costing the stall owners a combined 12,500 US dollars. <laughs> Up north, New Taipei was also affected by the storm. Scaffolding on the construction site collapsed, affecting neighboring houses. <laughs> In Kanding, Taiwan's southernmost point, waves hit the shores with violent force, washing debris onto the beaches. Local authorities had to set up red flags to stop beachgoers from swimming. But how could a typhoon that passed close to northern Taiwan also affect the southern region? Meteorologists say it's due to the corner effect. As the typhoon moves away, now the country can begin to clear up the damage it left in its wake. Klein Wong and Bing Wong for Taiwan Plus. Two of the four people killed in a car crash in northern Taiwan on Thursday were migrant workers who may have been working in the country illegally. That's according to local labor authorities. Police say six people were in the vehicle on their way to conduct maintenance at a Taiwan power company site in Taoyuan. They say wet conditions brought on by typhoon weather may have caused the vehicle to slip off the road and plunge into the valley. Authorities confirmed that two of the four people killed were Thai nationals. Another two Thai nationals were injured. Taoyuan's Labor Department is investigating their employment situation. Thai Power says the vehicle belonged to one of its contractors and that it's looking into the matter. Investigators are probing the cause of an accidental explosion at a missile base in southern Taiwan. Four people were injured in a blast at a base in Pingdong on Thursday. One man is in critical condition with burns over 95% of his body. The accident happened during a routine chemical disposal procedure. The injured workers reportedly had at least five years experience with the process. But officials say the protective gear available would not have withstood the heat. This is the second accidental explosion on a military base in the past two weeks. To talk more about these recent accidents and how they might affect the military, John Van Therese spoke to Zhang Jing, senior fellow at the Society for Strategic Studies. Does the military need to improve its safety culture in your view? Or are the sorts of accidents we've seen recently and in recent years just inevitable? First, uh, nobody wants uh, to see this the accident actually happen. Second, we do have a certain kind of standard a standard operating uh, procedure associated with what we call the risk management. But however, uh, as you may notice, that uh, during any kinds of bureaucratic systems, that in many cases, uh, once the uh, uh, institution or a system practiced many times, them, and then eventually you will become a formality and the people will ignore that. Does the military here have a higher incidence of accidents than in other countries? Or do we just hear more reports about them? The reason why they have the certain kinds of feeling that uh, the, in the Republic of China Armed Forces, the accident rate is high because uh, we have a higher service hours. So there's a more sophisticated drill and exercise we can actually engage. 
So once you're doing some uh, difficult uh, training uh, subject, then the accident rate will gradually, uh, you know, the increase the, the proportionally. So uh, does the, the frequency of accidents maybe indicate that uh, communist Chinese incursions into or in the area around Taiwan have had started wearing down on equipment? Theoretically, it sounds like that, but actually, I would uh, argue otherwise. There's a uh, different kinds of their models of Randy and keep on changing, and our uh, countermeasures to deal with the situation we also adopt them uh, with the more efficient way. We actually very flexible and uh, gradually adopt to some scheme that can uh, use our force more economically. Once again, that was John Ventria speaking with military analyst Zhang Qing. Accidents aren't the only problems facing Taiwan's military. It's still waiting for the delivery of over 23 billion U.S. dollars of weapons. Our reporter Jaime Ocon talked with Heritage Foundation security analyst Alex Velez-Green about the delay. There's almost 23 billion U.S. dollars worth of weapons and equipment that hasn't been delivered to Taiwan yet. And some have said that's because of the war in Ukraine, and others have said that's because of the pandemic, and also just logistical issues within the U.S. industrial base. But do we know the actual reason for why Taiwan hasn't seen delivery of these weapons? There is a substantial backlog that, that's in large part due to constraints on U.S. production capacity. We, we, we just don't have the ability to produce as many weapons as quickly uh, as, frankly, we need to. Uh, and that's been exacerbated by a lot of the things you just mentioned, the, the pandemic, some of those supply chain issues. Uh, certainly the war in Ukraine has taxed uh, existing production far more than, than many folks expected. So for all those reasons, the backlog has been exacerbated. Although I think, as you sort of alluded to in your question, it's been around for quite a while. This is not a new problem, but the urgency of dealing with it, um, it it's only grown. And now I would say it's actually extremely urgent, particularly when we think about Taiwan. From my understanding, the weapons that Ukraine is getting are from existing stockpiles, and the weapons that Taiwan is getting are from brand new production lines. Given those two separate production lines, why is there overlap and why is there sort of conversation between uh, a competition for Ukraine and Taiwan to get these weapons? The fact is that, you know, when we think about the weapons that Taiwan needs, um, many of them, first of all, are, are the same or very similar weapons to, to what Ukraine needs and has often received. And just in, from, a, from a sourcing perspective, many of those exist in U.S. stockpiles now, in many cases, at far lower levels because of how much we've sent to Ukraine. But many of the weapons that Taiwan needs can come from U.S. stockpiles. And the administration is finally just starting to take advantage of that. Many will also need to be produced. Um, new. Um, some of those are weapons that may be sort of specific to Taiwan. Many are not, frank, candidly. But the fact is, you know, from, from, from where I sit, the ability of the United States and Taiwan collectively to deter or for that matter, defeat a Chinese invasion in the next several years is, is at best questionable today. That wasn't true to the same extent even just four years ago. You know, the, the question you're asking in terms of sourcing and getting these weapons to Taiwan is exactly the right question. The answer is, we should be taking weapons from you know whatever sources available and moving them to Taiwan as quickly as possible. That's from U.S. inventories or new production. While Taiwan waits for these twenty-three billion dollars worth of weapons, is there anything that Taiwan should be doing right now, or any sort of capability that Taiwan should be looking towards instead while it waits for these weapons? Taiwan should speak up when the weapons that it needs it sees going to other places uh, instead of to Taiwan. It doesn't need to sort of engage in sort of diplomatic tit for tats or anything like that. But but it's important that Taiwan speak up for itself and what it needs. Um, but on that particular note, Taiwan needs to invest in the right capabilities. It is not a new thing that Taiwan needs to invest in certain what, what are called asymmetric defense capabilities, the kinds of weapons that can be fielded. They're relatively cheap on an individual level. They can be fielded in relatively large numbers. They're survival, they're mobile, anti-ship missiles, air and missile defenses, anti-tank weapons, these kinds of things. The Taiwan uh, Ministry of National Defense has not historically prioritized these. It's starting to but it's late to the game and it needs to do that far more aggressively than it has. That was Heritage Foundation security analyst Alex Velez-Green speaking to our reporter Jaime Ocon. Taiwan Plus also reached out to Taiwan's Ministry of National Defense for comment, but at the time of airing, we have not received a response. The U.S. and Australia have wrapped up a series of large-scale joint military exercises. As Jaime Khan reports, these drills are part of a growing trend among countries in Asia, which are working together against what they perceive as a common threat. 
For the past two weeks, over 30,000 troops from 13 different countries gathered in and around Australia for Talisman Sabre, one of the largest military exercises in Asia. The drill's focus on integrating land, air, and sea components, and it's part of a push by the U.S. and its Indo-Pacific allies to work more closely together. Being able to work with another military or another nation is about the human connectivity, and that is what this event is all about. And getting different people to speak different languages together to get an outcome is the outcome we're seeking to have. In recent years, the U.S. has been working to boost its military presence in Asia. And other allies like Australia and Japan are stepping up their military activity as well. This is all part of an effort to counter China's growing influence in the region. In the last decade, you've seen Australia really double down on this notion of collective security and the need for a collective approach to addressing regional security challenges. That's driven in part by China's growing military power and its increasingly coercive use of that military power. Beijing's rapid military growth is now seen as a serious threat for many countries. And China's naval and air force presence around the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait have pushed nearby countries to forge closer defense ties. The possibility that there might be a military contingency around Taiwan or involving Taiwan directly is a quiet driver of a lot of the conversations that are going on behind closed doors between Australia and the United States, between Australia and Japan, uh, but between those three countries together. And this security cooperation is likely to keep growing. The U.S. is treaty allies with South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, Thailand and Australia. And when it comes to regional hotspots like Taiwan or the South China Sea, the idea is that collective security can deter China from any provocative military actions. I think the, the most important message that China can take from this exercise and anything that our allies and partners do together is that we are extremely tied by the core values that exist amongst our many nations together. And we are prepared to actually operate together in defense of our national security interests. As these military exercises wrap up, the allies and partners that have been working together are hoping that this show of unity will be enough to deter any major military escalation in the Indo-Pacific. Andy Shri at Hameokan for Taiwan Plus. Singapore has carried out its third execution in eight days as the city-state continues its zero-tolerance policy on drug trafficking. The 39-year-old Singaporean was sentenced to death in 2019 for trafficking 54 grams of heroin. He said he thought he was delivering contraband cigarettes for a friend who he owed money to and didn't know it was heroin. His appeal was dismissed. He's the 16th person executed since the government resumed hangings after a pause during the COVID-19 pandemic. Human rights groups and the UN have urged Singapore to stop executions for drug offenses, saying there's no evidence the death penalty deters drug offenses. Two stabbing attacks have occurred in South Korea in the last two days, leaving 15 people wounded. Video from the city of Songnam shows a man chasing people with a knife in a department store. He began the attack on Thursday by ramming his car onto a sidewalk. 14 people were wounded and two are in critical condition. Police say a 22-year-old suspect has been arrested. Another attack occurred Friday in the city of Daejeon. The suspect stabbed a teacher at a local high school. Last month, a man wielding a knife stabbed at least four people in a capital Seoul, killing one person. Former U.S. President Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty to the second set of federal charges laid against him since April. But as Jeremy Olivier reports, the latest indictment may not hurt his chances as he seeks the Republican presidential nomination for 2024. Donald Trump leaves a rainy Washington, D.C. on Thursday. The former U.S. president had just been arraigned in federal court in the U.S. capital city. The case involves his alleged attempts to overturn his 2020 election defeat by President Joe Biden. That includes actions that Jack Smith, the special counsel for the case, says led to the Capitol riots on January 6, 2021. It was fueled by lies. Lies by the defendant targeted at obstructing a bedrock function of the U.S. government. Trump pleaded not guilty to charges including conspiracy to defraud the U.S. and depriving citizens of the right to vote. It was his third not guilty plea and the second federal indictment against him in four months. Around 100 protesters, both for and against Trump, gathered outside the courthouse. Many came with colorful signs, props, and costumes. Police patrolled the area, but the demonstrations were mostly peaceful. 
Before heading back to his home in Bedminster, New Jersey, Trump took aim at the latest indictment. Well, thank you very much. This is a very sad day for America. This is the persecution of the person that's leading by very, very substantial numbers in the Republican primary and leading Biden by a lot. Despite facing a growing list of criminal cases, Trump remains the clear frontrunner for Republican nominee for the U.S.'s upcoming 2024 election. A recent New York Times poll of Republican primary voters shows him with a massive 37-point lead over his main opponent, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. It's another sign that Trump's mounting troubles could boost his campaign rather than hurt it. Justin Wu and Jeremy Olivier for Taiwan Plus. Coming up after the break... You've probably heard of Taiwan's pineapple cakes, but there's another sweet treat that the country is known for. I'm Taiwanese boss. Every Wednesday, 8 10 p.m. on Taiwan Plus. For more stories from the tech hub Taiwan and around the world, download the Taiwan Plus app. Welcome back. You're watching Town Plus News. Taiwan's agriculture minister is in the U.S. to discuss food security at the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, forum. Chen Ji-chung attended a minister-level meeting of the forum in Seattle. Chen said agricultural production around the world is feeling the impact of the climate crisis. He added that it's essential for APEC members to share their knowledge with each other. Chen said he also hopes to push for cooperation between Taiwan and the U.S. on food security. Like 很多的玉米，大豆是从美国进来。我们也希望说，哎，它可以播种程度有一定的这样的一个，大家的合作的机制，那我们可以卖到台湾。A culinary exhibition in Taipei is showcasing the work of award-winning chefs and gourmets, but some delicacies from southern Taiwan, in particular, are drawing in the foodies. Joy Sung has the story. Seafood noodles. Meatballs, custard wheel cakes, you name it. Taiwan's highlight reel of food is here at the culinary exhibition in Taipei's World Trade Center. 600 vendors are here. Some are showcasing their craft, turning humble local ingredients, like a sweet potato, into an elevated caramelized treat. And crowds are excited to get a taste of local cuisines, as well as some special appearances from abroad. But the main attraction is a celebration of Taiwan's ingredients. And one region in particular has built an international reputation for its produce. Pingtung County lies on Taiwan's southernmost tip. It's a leader in the country's exports and is probably most famous for its sweet pineapples. So much so that those pineapples were banned by Beijing in 2021. In the face of a risky surplus, several countries rallied around Taiwan and bought up those pineapples, including Japan, when led by the late Japanese Prime Minister Abe Shinzo. Aside from pineapples, Pingtung is also well known for another sweet treat, chocolates. The county's cacao creations have won several international competitions, and the chocolatiers that have traveled up to this Taipei Expo say that what makes their bars so good is the Pingtung soil. Pingtung's 
The region's chocolate industry has its origins in Pingdong's abundant beetle palms. But most Taiwanese have weaned off chewing on those trees' beetle nuts, a mild stimulant. Instead, farmers started planting cacao. This year, the county brought in several medals from the International Chocolate Awards. Uh, Though chocolate may not be considered one of Taiwan's signature foods, these Pingdong chocolatiers are proud that their homegrown cacao products are well loved by fans both here at home and around the world. Scott Huang and Joyce Zen for Taiwan Plus. Opponents and supporters of a controversial tourism development on Taiwan's southeast coast demonstrated in a capital Taipei on Friday. The Plat Mandifu Resort in Taidong County would see hotels, campsites and restaurants built on 10 hectares of tropical coastline. Environmental groups say the plan will damage local ecosystems, including coral reefs. Members of indigenous groups in the area say it will disrupt local cultural heritage. The project's developer claim the majority of local residents are in favor of the resort. It's land crab breeding season in southern Taiwan when countless crustaceans head to their breeding grounds. Our reporter Sandy Chi was there to see how a national park and local residents are offering the crabs a helping hand. Countless crabs carrying their eggs and heading across the land to release them into the sea. Each year from July to August is the peak of land crab breeding season in Tainan. Alone here around Taijiang National Park is home to 32 species of land crabs. Unlike other national parks in Taiwan, Taijiang is a wetland park located in the tropics, the perfect habitat for land crabs. Among the different species in the park, the most iconic is the brown land crab. Male crabs can grow up to 13 centimeters across, while female ones can reach 11 centimeters, an unusually large size for the creatures in this part of the world. The park says the crabs are threatened by poaching, pollution and climate change. But the biggest cause of crab death is traffic. In 2021, the National Park began instituting measures to protect crabs when they're crossing roads and to help them reach breeding grounds safely. This included putting up warning signs and laying down fabric to help the crabs climb up and down steep curbs. And to help keep them safe, many locals are also pitching in. Since the conservation efforts began, there has been a noticeable change in crab numbers. The park counts the creatures by marking them and noting the time and date they were spotted. Back in 2021, around 4,000 pregnant brown land crabs were found during the entire breeding season. But this year, around 5,000 of them were spotted in just five days during the season's peak. Oh. To live in harmony with the land crabs, the park had several street lights specially redesigned in 2020, as the old lights drew the crabs away from their breeding grounds. While the park and locals are working hard to protect the crabs, they've also been known to cause problems for some fish farmers. Most 
大家的鱼就跑过来跑过去了。Despite the problems the crabs cause, the community still wants to live in harmony with them. They hope to make the creatures a local icon, both to help attract tourists and to prove that their conservation efforts have worked. John Su, P. T. Zhuang, and Sandy Chi for Taiwan Plus. The world's largest arts festival, the Edinburgh Festival Fringe, kicks off on Friday. Artists from nearly 70 countries will bring thousands of shows to the city, and this year they'll include four pieces from Taiwan. Among them, two groups focus on circus art. One of those pieces is Hashtag Since 1994, which explores social labels forced upon women. The other, Duo, explores what relationship means through the interactions between two performers. There's also something for the kids. World in a Word was inspired by the process of teaching children Chinese characters. And The Way Back takes viewers on a journey on self-exploration through puppetry. Those are just a few of the more than 3,000 shows running throughout the city until August 28th. Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. Remember to download the Taiwan Plus app for more stories from Taiwan and around the world. Finally, today we leave you with images of Pope Francis being welcomed by hundreds of thousands of worshippers at World Youth Day in Lisbon, Portugal. I'm Betty Chen. Take care and see you next time.